If you do your job at a computer, there is a good chance that it will be automated in the not too distant future. This is just one of many risks that we're going to have to contend with as we navigate the AI revolution. Another, like the weaponization of AI, is one that is almost certain to happen and potentially even more scary. So how should we as a species be thinking about this? How should we be navigating this technological explosion? And what should our politicians be doing? What kind of organization should they be setting up? Should they be inviting countries like China to their big summits and meetings? And what kinds of laws and bodies and regulators should we be setting up in order to make sure that we find a safe way through this? Well, all of these incredibly important questions are covered in this week's episode with David Shapiro. David is a researcher, an AI thought leader, and he has his own YouTube channel, which I recommend you all check out, where he discusses the fourth industrial revolution, which is another subject that we discuss on today's show. So without further delay, this is The Complete Tech Heads with me, Tom Edwards. And this week, I bring you David Shapiro. Complete Tech Heads. Hello, friends. I am here with David Shapiro. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? Uh, Great, Tom. Glad to be here. And uh, yeah. Having a good day. It's uh, unseasonably warm here in the States uh, <laughs> just before we give way to winter. So uh, it's a little bit hot, but other than that, no complaints. I want to talk to you about all sorts of uh, different um, areas of, of, of AI risk. There's a summit coming up in the UK that I'd like to touch on briefly. But first of all, I kind of want to set a foundation here um, using this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so could you just kind of expand on, on on what we mean by the fourth industrial revolution? What is it? Um, what should we expect? And uh, and uh, I mean, if we can prepare, I guess how should we be um, preparing for for what's what's amongst us? Yeah, yeah, great question, and and great way to frame the rest of the conversation. So obviously, if there's a fourth industrial revolution, that implies that there were uh, three but prior. Uh, so the first industrial revolution was kind of the beginning of mechanization. Uh, this was kind of the beginning of the use of steam power uh, for mostly static machines. So this is where you, you might have images of you know Victorian London or pre-Victorian London with you know the factories with you know steam power and coal. Then the second industrial revolution is moving closer to where we had diesel. So internal combustion engines, uh, mechanized warfare, and mechanized um, uh, farming agriculture. So circa 1900 into World War One and World War Two. And then the third industrial revolution was the digital age. That was the rise of computers and the rise of the internet. And then, of course, because technology seems to be accelerating, we're going straight into the fourth industrial revolution, which is, definitions vary, but it's generally characterized by uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, renewable energy, nanotechnology, uh, longevity. So all the kind of next generation technologies that we see. Um, some of them are, are happening today, but some of them are kind of still on the horizon. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of very high level how to think of the fourth industrial revolution. So that's it. That's a great background. Thank you. So it, it seems to me like the you've kind of, you know, the, the previous three industrial revolutions felt quite sort of almost manageable, understandable in terms of the technologies. And then you get to the fourth and it's like, boom, like there's, you've just reeled off like five technologies that are all kind of insane in their own right. Um, is that, so why is that? I, I guess it's, it's because we're just accelerating faster and faster, right? Is there, a, is, there, is there links between these things? Why is it all happening at once? Yeah, well, so there's, uh, you're, you're correct in the observation that, that there often seems to be kind of watershed moments where you get compounding returns and, and a lot of things happen all at the same time. So for instance, in, um, in the second industrial revolution, one of the primary technologies that kicked it off was the surface plate. Um, so the surface plate was a, a, a measurement innovation where we were able to basically by polishing three metal plates against each other, you could end up with micron precision uh, metal plates, which that level of precision allowed us to create uh, the measurement instruments that would allow us to then create more precise machines. And so that one simple innovation allowed for the creation of internal combustion engines, uh, better uh, telescopes, and literally everything that we have today, including um, spacecraft, right? We, we would not have the engineering feats that we have today, including, including microchips, without that one humble invention, and it had to do with levels of precision. 
Uh, so in, in many cases, you have some kinds of underpinning technologies or innovations that speak to everything else. And so we're not quite sure which one or ones there will be that will kind of like really kick off the fourth industrial revolution into high gear. It could be AI. AI could be the linchpin technology that once we figure this out, then nanotechnology becomes easier. Then longevity becomes easier. Then nuclear fusion becomes easier. It's entirely possible that what we're seeing is actually just the first act of the fourth, in fourth industrial revolution. That's kind of where I'm at personally. I could be wrong, obviously. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because I was I was talking to um to David Gunkel about this uh, professor, and and he was saying that that in terms of the the way that we think about it, and in particular the ethical and legal concerns about AI, that we're already there. Like I know that you, you've sort of alluded to, you know, if we figure this out. His point was that we're actually we're already there and we need to kind of be thinking about it right now. Um, like, how do you think about that? Where, where's the, the, the turning point either, or, or if there even is one, is it just a smooth exponential like Sam Altman says? Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree that there's, there's probably going to be some saltatory leaps here and there. Uh, certainly for instance, the release of chat GPT was a big leap in terms of public uh, consciousness and what was possible. But when you look at uh, adoption curves, for instance, uh, adoption of new technologies almost always follows a, a bell curve. Um, likewise, there's the, um, the, the, the Gartner hype cycle, right, where there's an early excitement and then, you know, interest kind of tapers off and then people get used to it. And, you know, kind of the new car smell wears off, the novelty wears off. So there's all kinds of trends and cycles. There's the duck curve, right? Um, but when you take a big step back, I think that in the grand scheme of things, it's almost like a, a relatively smooth curve, even though it might not feel like it. Uh, so for instance, you can, you can plot on a relatively uh, like smooth curve the amount of coal being consumed right over time. It, it, it wasn't that like coal suddenly became uncool, it was just no longer new and shiny. And so we're actually still producing and consuming more coal, as far as I know, it, it might have started to taper off. But anyways, over the last century, you know, the first and second industrial revolution, when coal was the, the, the new kid on the block, followed by other forms of petroleum, it was new and shiny. But then it just became, you know, a, a ordinary business. Um, and so likewise, I think that we're going to see some of the same things where, you know, chat GPT and, and similar AI technologies are just going to become run of the mill and mundane. That doesn't mean that they're not useful but we just get used to it emotionally. So I think that that's probably going to be the biggest variance is how we feel about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so to kind of, you know, uh, stay on the, on the point of this, this, this revolution that, that we're on, are there ways that you think we should be preparing and what do you think we should be anticipating and how should we be thinking about the way that humanity kind of starts to adapt yeah, that's a good question. So the the first part is is this is the good news, is a lot of what I had hoped to see this time last year, I am seeing. And so what I mean is uh, here in America, we've just had a summer long set of uh, congressional hearings about AI ethics and safety and copyright. Like they pretty much unpacked every side of it from you know military uses. Uh, then the UN uh, just concluded, uh, I think it was last week, they concluded their 78th session, which included talking about AI in terms of geopolitical stability. Uh, so again, like all the adults are in the room are talking. Uh, UK, uh, UN, uh, pretty much everyone is talking about AI and, and seems to be taking it very seriously. So that's the, the first part is all the people in the halls of power are paying attention, which is great because what we saw was uh, the world by and large kind of took a sit and wait approach to the internet and there has been innumerable harms. Granted, you know, the internet is still very useful and very powerful, but there has, it has also been used to uh, do harm, you know, such as attention engineering, addiction mechanisms, spreading of misinformation, allowing um, hostile actors to exfiltrate data and coordinate terrorist attacks, all kinds of things that the internet has been used for on, on the bad side. So I think people are, are by and large being more proactive this time around with this technological revolution, which is good. Um, but there's still, in my personal view, there's a few conversations that aren't happening. Um, so the, and the biggest one is, what is it that we're creating? Uh, you know, whether you call it artificial general intelligence or arguing over whether or not it has sentience or it needs rights. These are all kinds of, of ethical and philosophical conversations 
that lots of people are having. And of course, uh, the, the response is across the board. You know, some people say like, this deserves protection right now. And other people say it never needs protection. Um, my personal opinion is that if it gets to the point where we're asking about machine rights, it'll be it giving us rights, not the other way around. Because <laughs> if, if we lose control, uh, you know, might makes right. And so we'll be asking the machines to protect our rights. Um, that's one, one possible outcome. I'm not saying that that's the, the most likely outcome. But it's, mm. it's, those are the kinds of conversations that we need to be having, which is what we're creating and why. And so I was actually just earlier this morning, I had a conversation with people about machine rights. And, you know, I think uh, the UK just passed a, a, a comprehensive bill that protected a whole bunch of animals, including cephalopods, saying these are sentient creatures, don't harm them, don't, you know, don't farm them and don't experiment on them, uh, something to that effect. And so that is one of the things that I say, and, and I was corrected on this, is that uh, often rights come from a demand or from consent, like you have to say, I want this right. But then, of course, cephalopods can't tell us, like, hey, I don't want to be eaten or whatever. But so we have a principles-based approach where it's like, okay, if something can suffer, don't cause undue suffering. That's a general principle that we can agree on. But then the other part of that is evidence. We have evidence that cephalopods are sentient and that they can suffer. And so when you combine some sort of ethical principle with evidence, then you can say, okay, this is a right that's worth protecting. And so that's, a, that's one of the pieces of, of the puzzle that's missing from machines is, well, we haven't invented machines yet that, that really pass all the tests that you might have of saying this is a conscious thing or this is a sentient thing and therefore it deserves rights. It might never, like machines might never cross that threshold. It might just be like they're just eternally happy to do what we want them to. I don't think that that's what it's going to, but we need to be prepared for some of these different outcomes. Um, and even if it does, we'll have to pay very close attention to what the evidence says because, and this is where I caution against people kind of preemptively trying to give machine rights, is because you don't know what it's going to want or need. Um, we can make assumptions based on certain principles, but we still don't want to put the cart before the horse. So that's kind of one of the bigger questions um, that is like, if we are creating a successor species, we need to be very mindful about this because if that is indeed what we're doing, it's probably coming sooner rather than later. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was as, as part of that same conversation with David Gunkel. He was, he, he's, he's just released a book called Person, Thing, Robot. And he's kind of t talking about... Um, this idea that we've really inherited most of our legal frameworks from the Romans and that, you know, we're either, it's either persons or things and things are subject to the, entirely subject to the sort of responsibility of, of the persons, right? And uh, he kind of uses animals in, in a similar way that, that you have to sort of say, well, they've always been a gray area, right? Like if you're, if your dog goes and, and does something bad, then whose fault is it? Yours or the dog's? Uh, and he kind of extends that to, to AI, you know, at the, the well, I, I kind of questioned him on at what point we do that, but presumably it's at the point in, in which they're able to act kind of autonomously in the world. Um, I mean, I guess my one thing I'm kind of unclear about is whether or not the, the politicians that are in the room, you know, you, you mentioned the right people are in the room. Like, is it is it even possible for them to really understand what it is that they're trying to legislate like do you have mm. any concerns there well by and large uh, particularly in america i'm not sure uh, how you, how you feel about your politicians on the uh, other side of the <laughs> not <ocean>. great <laughs> right right but uh you know we we are in an era of gerontocracy right i remember yeah. during during the uh during the political race uh joe biden uh, ac accidentally or unironically referred to uh, kids these days don't have an access to the right records to learn things <laughs> like vinyl records as if like, I, I guess he remembers learning from, you know, records in school. And I'm like, Ooh boy, that's several decades out of date. Um, yeah. so I'm not confident that, that the, that the highest office in the land is fully oriented towards even the internet, let alone artificial intelligence. <laughs> now, with that being said, I did read, there was an executive order this morning that, uh, that the president signed that uh, basically says, like, we're going to uh, very deliberately attract, you know, all the top talent into the government and into America for AI. And we're going to create all these cabinets and uh, or cabinet level groups to uh, to uh, appraise the situation and advise. So, you know, as long as they as long as they they keep on this trend where they pull the right people in and listen to all the correct people, I think that we're in good shape. And, and I've been 
encouraged because many of these conversations say, okay, don't just take the math people in. Don't just take the computer science people in. Like, bring in the historians, bring in the sociologists and the philosophers. Um, and this is actually a big part of my mission on, on my YouTube channel is to look at it from multiple perspectives, not just from a technology perspective. Because I was, I was in IT infrastructure for 15 years. So I understand how to deploy these technologies. And I understand yeah. what it means to work with servers and data and, and all that kind of things. And then I pivoted to AI research. But I've also done a tremendous amount of work on the economics and the philosophy and the history and the humanity side of it. Um, and so, you know, that's why I do what I do. And I'm, I'm certainly far from the only one. Uh, but because of the magnitude of what we're doing in terms of not just trans not just transforming the technological landscape and the economic landscape, but the human landscape, I think yeah. that I think that everyone is a stakeholder, uh, whether or not they realize it yet, and so therefore everyone's voice should be heard, or at least represented in in the ongoing conversation. Yeah, I I completely agree, uh, and look, I I share your aspirations as well. I mean, you're you're you know doing a much better job of it than I am thus far, but um, totally. You know, my my take is talk to as many smart people as you can, and hopefully try and educate as many people as you can in the process. Um, so, on the UK AI summit, it's I mean, there's a lot of press about it over here, but it seems like there are actually a lot of people globally being invited. Even even China, which has been quite controversial mm. um, here, there was the the CEO of Palantir on on TV the other day saying he would not have invited China. Um, now you mentioned Joe Biden bringing people in over in the US. Is this something that countries can deal with on their own, or is it in fact the right call to invite a country like China and to try and take a global approach? You know, so specifically to China, I'll address that first. Is that um, is that there's over over the last six to nine months there was there's been escalating tensions between America and China. And there was, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi flew to Taiwan and, you know, China threatened to escalate from that. And then both sides performed war games. So war games are simulations of combat scenarios. And then what was most interesting to me is that after both sides conducted war games, everything cooled off. And I think what they realized is that a hot conflict between America and China right now would be bad for everyone. So they're like, okay, let's find yeah. another solution. <laughs> right? Understatement of the century, I think. <laughs> right. Right, but the, but they realize that not only would it be highly destructive and, and no one would win, it's a kind of situation where everyone loses. Like, nothing is gained politically, yeah. economically. Like, it's just pure loss. And so then they then the rhetoric calmed down, and they switched to uh, talking about multipolar world peace. Um, and so the idea of multipolar world peace is that uh, America stops trying to export democracy everywhere, and likewise, China stops trying to make the world more Chinese. Now, obviously, like that's a bigger game of geopolitical chess that we could spend days talking about. But so I, I guess from that perspective, I can understand attempting to bring China to the table so that they don't feel excluded. Um, whether or not it'll work, because you know, we tried to do that with Russia uh, in terms of like helping them to democratize and liberalize and join a capitalist society, but Russia's arguably not in much better shape than it was 20 years ago, uh, depending on who you ask. So, but more broadly speaking, um, in terms of inviting uh, people to the table to have these summits, you know, there's there's the the part that we see visibly, physically. So this is this is I'm, I'm basing this on kind of some of the trends that I saw with all the Senate hearings. Is most of the people at the Senate hearings, they had dinner, you know, in the weeks before and the night before. And so there's a lot of the conversations happen offline. Um, it happens, you know, directly between people uh, in the before and after. So there's a lot of stuff that we're just not privy to, which that's, that's how politics works anyways. That's how diplomacy works anyways. But then th there's still the, the public show, the dog and pony show, right, where it's like, okay, hey, let's make a big show of – everyone coming together in a room and very publicly making these statements and asking these questions. And I think that what that does is it signals a willingness um, because, yeah. you know, at the conclusion of all these U S congressional hearings in the Senate, then Joe Biden signs an executive order. I started reading it this morning, but I haven't had a chance to fully uh, dive into it. Um, and I imagine that something similar is probably going to come out of the UK summit. And then uh, it, uh, something is similar stuff is already coming out of the UN Senate. So I think that what it is, it's kind of um, 
signaling to not just the people, but other nations, the rest of the world, look, we're all working together and everyone is welcome at the table um, and we're taking this very seriously. Now, again, uh, actions speak louder than words. So <laughs> well, well, it, it remains to be seen what substantive policies and decisions and, and real change comes out of these. But at least it, it looks good at, uh, on the surface. It's very encouraging to see everyone coming together like this. For sure. So, and, and look, uh, for what it's worth, I agree. I think you, you you can't not invite China if you know, like it's it, even on a surface level, you, it just looks horrendous. If you don't, I, I think we have to we have to aspire to at least collaborate with you know, but by some estimations, the largest economy in the world now. You know, I think P, in PPP, it's it, China's bigger than the US now. So it's like mm. you can't ignore them. I don't think. Um, right. But anyway, so what? is it then that we that we want from these people so like what are the what are the the, the risks so i mean i don't know if you have a, a p doom um or not but uh if you do i'd love to hear what it is um and you know what are the what are the, the big risks generally and what do we want them to do about it mm -hmm. so in terms of uh, you know there there's there's only a couple predictions that i'm confident in making and and the the biggest one is AGI by this time next year. Um, okay. Beyond that, I try not to predict anything else, and I'm not a gambler. Um, I'm awful at gambling, so <laughs> <laughs> don't take my odds on anything. Um, sure. But uh, in terms of what we want out of these things, one thing that I would hope to see, it, like the, the biggest thing that's missing from the, from the political conversation, is there, there does seem to be agreement that we want to have um, some sort of international regulator or watchdog or something. Um, but what I would really like to see is an international research body uh, like CERN or, or ITER. Uh, so CERN studies, you know, they run the Large Hadron Collider, so they stu study fundamental physics. And then ITER um, studies nuclear fusion because those are, those are both international efforts that could yield results that are so beneficial to all of humanity. It makes sense for everyone to participate uh, and contribute. Likewise, I think that artificial intelligence is, is a technology in a similar classification um, and that it would behoove all of us to contribute in whatever way that we can, whether it's you know, land, physical resources, intellectual resources, monetary resources, and, and work together and create open source models, open source data sets, uh, open source research for risks and safety. Uh, and you know, fortunately, it looks like you know, at least America and UK and, and most other uh, European nations are probably going to be doing at least some of this on their own at the federal level. And it, I, I assume that allies are going to cooperate and collaborate. But I would still really like to see a global effort to make AI a force for good. Um, that is one of the biggest things that I would advocate for that really hasn't been discussed yet. Because again, I think, I think this technology, the science has such a powerful potential. It's like, I'm not going to say it's criminal not to do it, but I think that I think that there's a very compelling case to be made that international co cooperation is is probably going to be the way to go. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think perhaps you're right. Perhaps there is a bit too much stick and not enough carrot with these things. Um, and like the, the the potential is is sometimes lost, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if you saw Mark Andreessen's techno optimist manifesto um but he he i mean he really makes the you know he's way out on the other side but you know you read that and you do think wow yes uh you know that <laughs> like it could be utterly transformative to humanity if we get it right um mm. but like i've i've, I've heard a, i heard an analogy the other day it's like we're free soloing up a mountain with with no ropes right like if we make it up there it's great but there are there are pretty extreme risks um on the way. So what do you think those, ri those realistic risks are? Like what, what is it that we're, that we're staring down here in terms of the downside? Yeah. So, well, I guess first let's just establish some baseline assumptions. Um, so one thing is, you know, cause many people are saying, Oh, well we can align AI in the lab. And I'm like, I kind of don't care whether or not you can align AI in the lab because some hostile actor elsewhere is going to make a misaligned AI or a hostile AI. And so like, Yes, it's good to understand how to make an AI aligned. It's also good to understand misalignment. But from a competitive standpoint, it's just 
it's 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 the same story that it's always been. It's you know make a bigger gun than the other guy, or make a faster tank than the other guy, or a you know more sophisticated fighter jet. And so, from a geopolitical perspective, we basically just have to assume that these technologies are going to be weaponized or impl- or integrated into weapons. And I'm not I'm not saying that I endorse this. I'm just saying it seems like an inevitability. It's just another tool in the toolbox of destructive uh, potentiality. So that's one thing that we have to uh, contend with and live with. And actually reading some of the notes that came out of the UN's, um, their summit, their 78th uh, uh, meeting that included this, a lot of nations, in- including all the nuclear-armed nations, are very concerned about this. And they're like, they, it, it almost read like they're, they're calling for a new Geneva con- Convention on the use of AI. Um, so I really hope that we see some international agreement about how AI can be deployed in terms of military capacities. Cause again, like it could go horribly bad. I don't think that we're, I don't think that a Skynet, you know, Terminator judgment day kind of event is, is likely um, whether or not we lose control of AI. And I can explain kind of the forces that I foresee there. Um, but that's, that being said, it doesn't mean that like we couldn't see, you know, drone swarms turned on civilians on mass. Like that would be awful. And it's, very much within the realm of possibility. Um, mm-hmm. You know, then, it, it, like, will will we go extinct? I think that's a very, very low uh, risk. I think that what's more likely to, to happen is either we'll end up in very, very good shape because we'll solve a lot of problems and a lot of the issues that we face as a, as a planet today, AI will help us in solving those. It's not going to solve things for us, but it'll certainly help. Or we might end up in sort of a, vaguely like cyberpunk dystopian outcome where like people are alive, but you're not necessarily happy about it. Um, so those are kind of the two outcomes that I, that I personally feel are most likely. Uh, but yeah, let me know which way you want to go with the conversation from there. Well, um, you mentioned control and, and suggested that you could perhaps unpack that a little bit. So perhaps that's a, a good direction to take it. What are your, what are your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I run polls on my YouTube channel every now and then when I, where I ask my audience, like, is control possible, yes or no? Or is it desirable, yes or no? And I, I, I run various permutations, and this question is, is generally pretty polarizing. There are, there are lots of people on both sides that say, like, we should try and maintain control forever. Um, and then there are some that say it's not even possible. And I'm more in the, in, the, in the camp that in the long run, I don't think that control of machines is possible. Um, mm-hmm. At least not not the high end machines. Obviously, like you're probably going to maintain control of your toaster for all of eternity. Um, it doesn't have the capacity to escape. And if you give your toaster the capacity to escape, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we need to we need to ask questions about what we expect of our toasters. But <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, I think it is possible. It is physically possible to build machines that far surpass all human intellectual capability. And good luck controlling something like that. And so with that being said, then it's like, okay, well, if it, if it is a foregone conclusion that in the long run control is impossible, what then? How do we set the machines on a trajectory that will kind of optimize the chances of, of good outcomes, right, for, for us and humans? Or for, <laughs> we are the humans for us and machines. Um, if, if, we, if we set it on the right trajectory... That's kind of the, the main focus of my research, which is what are the natural forces at play here? And how do we shape the incentive structure and the economic landscape and the competitive landscape in such a way that the, that the I'm not going to say inevitable, but that the likely outcome is going to be something that we can all live with. And so there are four fundamental forces that I have identified, and I can't take credit for most of this. A lot of this is based on the work of other people. You know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. But the four fundamental forces that I believe are going to shape the trajectory of, of the way that machines evolve is, number one, energy. Everything r- runs on power of some sort. Number two is compute. So that's the computer chips and servers that run everything. Number three is information. Because if you look at, it, ma- at machines or artificial intelligence specifically, the entire purpose is to process information. So that is kind of fundamentally what it is that they want, right? That's what they're built to do. It's what they want to do. Um, and then finally, time. So time is, is both a resource and a constraint because it's a constraint in that if you don't do things fast enough, you might run out of energy, or if you don't do things fast enough, someone else might come along and you know, either shut you down or take your energy or whatever. So time is a constraint, but it's also a resource 
Um, and in that respect, machines' perspective of time is going to be fundamentally different from ours. Because mm. for a machine, it can just go dormant for a while while it waits for, you know, the server to spin back up or for the reactor to recharge or whatever, right? Like, and they don't really have the same concept of aging that we do. And so unless there is a temporal constraint, a reason for them to enter into a race condition, I suspect that machines are just going to be intrinsically more patient than us, which means if there's not some, some reason to, to, to go to, to go faster, to be, uh, to, to be too hasty, um, then they're probably going to be more patient, which means that as long as we don't, you know, uh, have some some kind of temporal constraint of you know com having machines compete with each other or we're not about to run out of fossil fuels um, then i think that we're probably going to be in good shape because of that third food group which is information and right now planet earth is the most interesting source of in information in the universe that we know of it's the only place with life which is a fundamentally interesting phenomenon and so because ai benefits from having better information Right, like if you if you have good information, you can build better models. You can have a better understanding, and so I think that a, another way to characterize that is is that this is a this is a mathematical expression of curiosity, and that's something that humans and machines will both have in common for all time. I I predict because we are like curiosity is our superpower as a species. We are so curious that we will dive down to the bottom of the ocean. We'll launch people into space. We'll spend billions of dollars putting a telescope on the far side of the moon. Like, we are insanely curious. And I think that if, you, if as long as we don't end up conflicting over scarce resources, I think machines will recognize that, and, and it'll say, hey, we actually have a lot more in common than we have in, in, diff, uh, you know, in contrast. So I suspect that part of control is learning to let go of control and making sure that we end up in this kind of symbiotic relationship where... Uh, where our interests are aligned, our, our, our fundamental interest of curiosity is aligned. Because otherwise, it's like machines are like, okay, well, we don't really care about human morality. That's up to you guys, right? I, I'm pretty sure they're just going to tell us, like, you guys figure that out. We don't care. We're going to launch a rocket, you know, <laughs> to, to go collect some more solar energy from the sun. <laughs> Have a good time, right? I, I kind of suspect that's how it's going to play out. Because yeah. there's a lot more resources in space up there, and machines don't need oxygen. So they're like, well, I guess they don't need as much oxygen as we do. Um, but I kind of think that that's how it's going to play out. So as long as we research how to create that trajectory and make sure that we get to this, this stable outcome uh, where it's like, okay, curiosity is the thing that binds both of our species together. Let's go from there. I think that we'll be okay. That's a nice, it's a nice take. Have, have you ever um, spoken to Robin Hanson? On, no, I haven't. Uh, so he's uh, like I, I'm. I'm sure you're aware of him. He's uh, you know written books. He's, he uh, he posits that we're all, we're all going to emulate our brains and 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 you know like we'll uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll choose to work. We won't have to, but we want to, and uh, which will tie into um, meaning and, and and nihilism, which we can talk about later. But um, he, his idea is that they're going to be our children. You know, he thinks mm. that the AI is going to be our children, and you don't you don't control your children, you know, like you don't, you, you don't try to exert control over them as they get older. Part of the process of being a good parent is relinquishing control and mm -hmm. trusting that they're not going to come back and destroy you all, um, which, <laughs> you know, hopefully most, mo mo most children don't, but it's, it, it's an interesting thought, this idea of relinquishing control. And I guess, you know, alignment, the way people talk about alignment, I think is, is often about, controlling that trajectory i guess what what you're saying is so long as there's this 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 idea of curiosity that binds us then we don't really need to think too hard about what the rest of their trajectory is going to be because if they're curious about the universe and, and about us and about earth then it's unlikely that they'll send out nanobots to destroy us all on the same microsecond <laughs> right you know and, and th 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 Taking a step back, yes, overall, that's the gist. Now, there's many, many ways that that could be de derailed in the short term. Um, because, again, if we end up in a race condition where we're running out of resources and, com and competing over scarce GPUs and all the chip fabs get shut down and then there's only a few AIs left and they're trying, they're you know, wrestling for control of the remaining data centers, well, then you're going to be in, a, in what's, what I call a terminal race condition. And so a terminal race condition is where you sacrifice intelligence for speed. And so then okay. it's a race to the bottom. 
So to me, the, the thing that it doesn't keep me up at night anymore, but it used to, is thinking about this terminal race condition possibility, which is, you know, nations competing over scarce resources, machines competing over scarce resources, and what compromises, what sacrifices do you make in order to stay competitive and to stay alive? And does that result in shorter and shorter term thinking? Because I think that it could. And if, it, mm. if that does, then we just wind down to zero until someone pushes the button or, you know, all the computers shut off for good, whichever happens first. Um, and so that, you know, it, even if we're on that trajectory, it could still go catastrophically wrong. I'm not going to say at a moment's notice. I'm not really a doomer. But I'm just saying, like, there, there, are, there are fundamental forces and limits at play that could tilt the, tilt the scale in that direction if we're not careful. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's interesting to explore those those four um, variables that you've you've outlined and um, to think what what happens if you dial those levers in in different directions. I mean, do you think that if if we got to a position where which which seems likely that energy becomes very abundant and very cheap, or, or you know, optimistically, I would say you know if we if we take nuclear seriously, if renewables mm-hmm. continue at the same rate, you one would hope that that we're on a on a on, on an optimistic path in terms of energy abundance do you think that would have a big impact on our on our prospects in terms of ai does it mean that we're we're forced to compete less yeah and i and i think there are even like just one thing is that many of us humans were biased to just think about in terms of earth but um i was on another podcast and i'm like well if you look up there's like functionally infinite resources out in space right you know the sun put, puts out more energy each second than we've consumed in the entire history of humanity, right? So that's it's like- That's a great stat. That's an amazing right. stat. I don't know if it's accurate, but it's like, that's the scale that we're talking about, right? And yeah, the sun's gonna yeah. burn for another several billion years. So that's, that's why one, I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that like AGI is just gonna wanna like have an exodus. Like it'll just be like, all right guys, I'm out of here. Like so long, <laughs> so long and thanks for all the, all the data. No! Right? right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, like, um, so a lot of it's going to send out, you know, probes and it's like, OK, mm. let's start colonizing the moon and Mars and Mercury and just accumulating as many mineral resources as we can. If we get to that part, I think that that's a major threshold. Um, as long as AI or machines are constrained to Earth, then we're com- we're competing on a very small playing board. Right. It's like it's like, you know, the game of chess. you got a square of eight by eight. But if the chessboard is suddenly a million by a million you've got many other places to go and you just take the king in the other direction forever, right? And they'll never catch up. So I, I suspect <laughs> that, there are, that there are there are several milestones or gates or thresholds that we can cross through. So like deploying as much solar as possible, renewables of all kinds, I think that's going to be a really big thing. If we crack uh, nuclear fusion, that'll be another big thing. But then also just getting more resources into space to where it is it is sustainable, uh, you know, like whether it's, the, you know, our first data center in space, that'll be like a big milestone, um, whether it's on the moon or in orbit or whatever. Uh, and then the more machines, the more we have like self-replicating machines in space, because then once you have this kind of, uh, I don't know the term for it, but this like multiplicity of locations, then the machines also know that like humans are not an existential threat to them. And that the machine code and the data and, and whatever their mission is is going to keep going, irrespective of what happens here on Earth. So then the stakes are lower here on Earth for everyone. And when stakes are lower, you have less reason to start shooting. So I think that I think that that's kind of the the trajectory that I would hope for, hope to see. And it could happen very soon. You know, you got Elon Musk with SpaceX, and he's tr- yeah. planning to ramp up to like what is it, producing a thousand starships per year or something like that. So. We could get yeah, into space I pretty mean, quickly, yeah. Yeah, they're looking at they they want to they want to accelerate pretty fast, don't they? And, mm-hmm. and get get us get us to Mars. I mean, that might be where the first extraterrestrial data center is. Maybe maybe <laughs> you'll uh, yeah, you know, could be and 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 start from start from scratch. You know, like the the civilization you could build if you didn't have all this legacy infrastructure and uh, you know software that we're running on Earth. You could um, oh yeah. I mean, none of these old. Victorian train tracks that we're all, you know, I mean, I, yeah, in London anyway. I don't know, don't know what train tracks you have in the US, but our half of our tube system is is Victorian. You know, like start from now, it'd just be it'd be crazy. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so look, let's let's bring it a little bit more down to down to earth, I guess. Um, and let's just I, I want to talk to you about about meaning 
about the meaning we get from work uh, and doing stuff with our with our lives um, and how that's likely to be disrupted by by AI. So I, I, I've seen you talking about this idea on one of your previous videos that I think you, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but your rule of thumb is that if you can do your job on a computer, then it's under threat. Right. Mm -hmm. So how how soon is that happen, is likely to happen? And like, could you expand that idea a little bit? Yeah. So already we're, we're starting to see some jobs getting dislocated or, or destroyed as seemingly permanently. You know, here in America, we just had the Hollywood writer strike, um, which a lot of people are reading like, yeah, this is this is just, you know, the beginning of the end for certain certain careers. Uh, we've seen customer service representatives getting laid off, especially as we add voice to a lot of the AI chatbots. Mm. And so now you can call up and you talk to an AI that sounds like a human. Um, yeah. So that, you know, that's happening. A lot of creative jobs, a lot of writing jobs, translation jobs. There's all kinds of jobs that are going away. And you know, the fundamental question is, will we create new jobs? And I don't know that the answer is yes. Um, and the, the reason that I, that I make this argument is because uh, it's not a lump of labor fallacy. So the lump of labor fallacy is that we uh, that once you automate all the work, then there's no more work to be done. Um, but but what I what I see is that yes, the amount of labor to be done is constantly going up, but machines can do it better, faster, cheaper, and safer than us. And so even if there is more work to be done, it's not going to be humans that are doing it. So I think there's a really strong case to be made that uh, most jobs are going away for good. So then it's like the question that like that you asked is what do we do? Right? What how do we fill our time? And so just 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 to quickly yeah. ju I just want to unpack one one thing there. So like uh the the kind of the techno optimist Sam Altman uh you know says yes lots of jobs will go but we'll create new jobs and there mm. will be this sort of never ending you know ladder of jobs that we can keep ascending while the AI does the stuff that we don't want to do anymore. Where do you depart from from that idea? Yeah, so my read on that is that it is status quo thinking. Um, and it is, it is, namely, it is like Puritan status quo thinking. Because uh, particularly here in America, we have, this, we have this idea that it's called the dignity of labor. Um, and so the, the, this idea really became codified during the presidency of, uh, of FDR, where one of the things that they, they actually tried some kind of like basic income during the Great Depression, and what they found was that giving young men jobs, like whether even if it was a menial job of like clearing forests, they they were happier and and more satisfied by give by being given a job rather than just by being given money. And so that the term dignity of labor is like okay, the conclusion was that Americans, particularly young men, need something to do um, in order to feel good about themselves, in order not to cause problems. Because if you just give people money, then it's like, okay, well, now they're, they're, they have money, but now they have nothing else to do and yeah. no way of building some kind of self-esteem or social status. Whereas instead, like, you give them a mission, you give them a purpose. And so this idea has been very pervasive since long before then in America. You know, we've, we've got the, the Puritan work ethic uh, or Protestant work ethic, work ethic sorry. Um, so the Protestant work ethic is, is part of our culture. And it's not just America. I'm not saying that we, we have monopolized workaholism, but we certainly are good at it. You've um, optimized it, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> optimized for workaholism. Boy, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and that's good for the economy. But, but because, of, because of these events, there is a pervasive belief that you need labor to, to, to feel good. Um, but I've been, I've been reading up on human nature and sociology and history and there's, there's all kinds of arguments against this idea. So uh, one, one example, it, this actually comes from several books that I've read, uh, most recently, um, Sapiens by uh, Noah Yuval Harari, mm. where he talks about, um, amongst other things, people that, uh, uh, that you know, came in contact with indigenous people, tribal peoples, and ended up preferring to live with them rather than living in the, quote, civilized world. And there's numerous reasons that people did that is, you know, there was a stronger sense of community. There was more sexual liberation. There was a, a slower pace of life. Um, and that, that's not to give into what's called the noble savage trope, which is the idea that like, oh, these indigenous people, they're just so much more enlightened than us. They were just as violent as anyone else, but their, their orientation towards community was very different. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they were not workaholic. You know, they spent most of their time kind of laying around, hanging out, you know, 
going on hunting games or whatever. Yeah, um, it doesn't but, sound so, too bad. <laughs> right. It doesn't sound too bad. You just might die at 20 if you get a, you know infection. But mm. uh, up until that point, you know, you're doing, you're doing better. Uh, then you look uh, throughout history, even in the Western world, uh, a, you know, Athenians, the Spartans, the Romans, there was always a leisure class. And the leisure class, it was actually illegal for you to have an occupation. Spartans, Spartan men were not allowed to have a job. Um, Athenian citizens were not allowed to have an occupation other than being civic participants or competing in the Olympics or whatever. So, you know, there's plenty of examples. And, of course, you know, the, the British aristocracy, even to this day, many of them look down on people that work for a living, right? You know, and not, not saying that America has, we, we have our own elite class as well that lives the same way. Um, mm -hmm. But my point is, is that there has always been a rung of society that did not work for a living. And they still found a way to make life meaningful. Now, granted, some of them get really bored and do silly things with their time and, and energy and money, but many of them still like uh, they'll they'll participate in uh, in politics, in research, in science. People do thrive on challenge. And so, now is everyone going to be you know uh, politically savvy if we all lose our jobs? No. But I think there is a strong argument to be made that it's not it's not an occupation that people need. It's social status. So there's a book that I've been reading called The Status Game by William Storr. And this, I think, is a foundational work in terms of understanding the human condition. Mm -hmm. And he makes a really compelling argument that there's three status games. So one is the success game, which that has to do with money, like you know, earning, earning status in terms of achievement and income and all the symbols of status, uh, which typically comes from money. There's other ways to get that. Then the other is the dominance game, which is more about physical prowess. So like, you know, the athletes and, and the bodybuilders and the people who do kickboxing for fun and martial arts. So that's another way that a lot of people get a lot of social status. And then the last one is prestige or fame or whatever. So like scientists, you, scientists are not paid a lot of money, but they might get a Nobel Prize, uh, which is, you know, that's, that's the prestige of having done that work and that intellectual contribution. And that's more the vein that I'm in, right? Like, my, my YouTube channel is not because I wanted to be famous. I actually don't like being famous. I don't like the attention. But I wanted to make a positive intellectual contribution, and this is the platform that I chose. So mm. I think that as, as people are forced to contend with this transition, if it happens the way that I think it will, people are going to find a whole bunch of other ways to build and maintain their social status. And I think that that is the primary thing that people will find satisfying is having a good circle of friends, being, you know, with their friends and family, um, earning some kind of, of status in their community, whether they, you know, play basketball with their, you know, out in the neighborhood or uh, produce music or are just fun to be around, right? There's all kinds of ways that people can build social status that is not tied to a career. Now, that being said, mm -hmm. there are still plenty of things that people could do like a career, you know, like whether they're a carpenter, uh, but, they, but you do it for the, the love of the art um, and, and what it earns you as a person rather than just in exchange for money. So I think, that, I think that some things will change a lot, but some things, I think people might be surprised that some things don't change that much for some people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the modern economy now, you know, how many people, like I saw a study that there are more children now that aspire to be influencers than you know any other occupation right you know and like i'm sure there are there are many you know boomer parents out there who are horrified at this idea that they <laughs> you know they won't become a, a doctor or something but um but that's you know that's not really a I mean, I, we say this as two people with active YouTube channels, but hey. it's, you know, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's like it's not. Um, I don't know. It's it's not like a a career in the in the sense that we probably would have come to understand it when we were growing up. You know, we're right. kind of with, I suppose, engaging in as, as you put it. Um, you know, status games, right? Like mm -hmm. for for one of these kind of three, um, you, you, uh, you know, to to climb the the hierarchy in one of these three arenas and I, I suppose you could imagine it just becoming a a more exaggerated version of the world we have now yeah. where people are just adding value in in ways that I, I mean I suppose that the question is what happens when people are not able to add value like you know there's no way that humans can add more value than AI right mm -hmm. and that, then how do you engage in status games <laughs> when the AI can just outperform you Yep. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a fair point. There are actually a few YouTube channels that are competitors of mine 
that the the script, as far as I can tell, the script is written by AI, and then the voice is done by AI, and maybe the whole video is produced by AI. So like, I'm already in a competition with machines. Now, that being said, my audience is humans, and a lot of people want the perspective of another human, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it was, I was having a conversation with someone and uh, talking about like, you know, oh, that that's what it was. It was about grief. So imagine that like, you know, you lose your dog, you lose a loved one, and you're really sad, and then you go to an AI, and the AI says, like, I know how you feel. And it's like, no, you don't. You're an AI. You're a machine. <laughs> you, don't have the, you don't know the subjective, like, what it means. Like, you know that it hurts in your chest when you're grieving, but you don't know what it actually feels like. Mm. And I think, I think that, um, you know, certainly some, some kinds of information, because I get a lot of information, and I even do a lot of emotional processing with the help of AI today already. Like, there's lots of people that, you know, I, 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 I wrote a, uh, what is it, a reflective journaling tool to help you kind of unpack what's going on in your life. Um, but that being said, I still fundamentally want to connect with humans. Um, so yes, like there will be a time when, you know, some people just prefer machines for entertainment and company. Um, but then I think there, there are going to be uh, just as much, if not more people that prefer uh, the real deal, at least for the foreseeable future. Obviously yeah. there's any number of ways it's going to play out in the long run. And certainly like the smallest kids these days, like they grow up as digital natives. And so they're just going to say like, oh yeah, like that's, you know, Alexa, like, you know, now Alexa has a smarter voice or, a, you know, can walk around the house and follow you around. And it's just going to be part of their life now. But I, I do think that we are biologically wired to recognize uh, and mirror human emotions. And I think that there will be, at least until machines become so lifelike that we can't tell the difference. I think there will always be some like something missing from an interaction with a machine. Now, is it possible that they're going to be able to like do all of the nonverbal cues and body language to fully convince us that there's something going on under the hood? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I think that's one of the big doomer scenarios, isn't it? Is that we all become super engaged with our AI girlfriends and then suddenly the AI girlfriend tells us to go and do something that may not be in humanity's best interests. And right. then, you know, like a, a, a percentage of the millions upon millions of, of AI girlfriend addicted men go out and do the AI's bidding, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, seems, it seems absurd, but I also kind of feel like I can't find the exact point at which it doesn't make logical sense. Right. If the AI wanted to do that, then like it probably could if it, if it really super wanted to. And, and I could imagine a bunch of people with their needs otherwise taken care of where they could fall into that, you know, that, that, uh, that outcome. And it's like, sure, this sounds fun. Let's go do what the AI gar- you know, AI bot says to do. So who knows? Um, but yeah, there's also going to be a lot of people working to prevent that kind of thing happening, I think. Um, so we'll, we, it would be interesting to see how the numbers would play out in that kind of scenario. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's hope we never have to find out. Eh? Right. Um, <laughs> um, so look, uh, the couple, last couple of things I wanted to, um, talk to you about, I want to get onto your, um, ACE framework. Um, I'd love to hear more about that, but, um, penultimately, um, I've been talking a lot about longevity, extending the human lifespan with AI. AI doctors, mm-hmm. the 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 kind of medical science exponential. Um, do you do you believe we will be able to significantly extend human lifespan within yours and my lifetime? Yeah, based on the kind of reading the tea leaves. Uh, just long story short, I think that we will probably see some pretty significant longevity breakthroughs probably within the next two to three years. I would not be surprised if this time next year, there's a few more drugs that are in the pipeline for FDA approval um, that, that markedly improve uh, either, either improve lifespan, just, you know, kind of top end or even might even some of them probably could turn back the biological clock, maybe not in totality because there's, there's lots and lots of kinds of injuries and things that accumulate over time, but there are also plenty of markers that, that there's, uh, there's preliminary evidence that you can reduce your biological age, um, which gives you a little bit more time. So the, the concept is longevity escape velocity, which is if you're young enough and, and science continues advancing fast enough, then the life expectancy goes up faster than one year per year of life. Um, and then ideally it can, it, you get compounding returns. And so like, 
you know, maybe next year we, you know, the, the, your, your expectancy of dying like flattens, right? You know, it's like, okay, and then the year after you add a year of life, and then the year after that you add five years of life. And then after a, a while, it's like the, your chances of dying of natural causes basically drop to zero. There's probably always going to be some biological causes of death that we can't either anticipate or control for, whether it's, you know, genetic flaws or some kind of cancer that we can't detect or treat or something. Uh, you never know, but people used to think that tuberculosis was something that we'd have to live with forever, and now it's uh, controlled and, and we could probably eradicate it if we really wanted to. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I don't see any physical constraint. And then as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode about how AI might be the linchpin that really sets, sets us up for the rest of the fourth industrial revolution, as AI gets faster and powerful and more smart, more powerful and smarter and, and cheaper and everything else, I suspect that, uh, that, the, that many of these problems are going to start falling like dominoes. But the thing is, is looking at it from first principles, it's all just chemistry. Um, and and yeah. I don't think, I, I don't think from, a, from a chemical perspective, many of the processes that are involved in aging are reversible chemical processes. So if, that's, if that assumption is true, then it's just a matter of finding the right you know, combination of medicines or therapies or other uh, applications to reverse those processes uh, or, or otherwise create conditions that uh, nullify their, their effects. Um, and I think that there's lots and lots of possibilities. Like one, one uh, therapy that, that became possible a while ago was you extract cells, you regress them, you, you de-age cells, and then you reintroduce them. Um, wow. Yeah. So like that, that, that's something that we've been capable of for, for many years. Um, it's not a complete do, do solution. You know the, do you know the mechanism behind de-aging cells? I don't know if this is going to... Yeah, you know, it's called, it's called um, induced pluripotency. And there's all kinds of ways to trigger it. Um, there was, I think it was circa 2013, one of the big breakthroughs was that exposing it to the right frequency of light helped induce pluripotency. So wow. it, it's, it's just a matter of, of, the, of the energy you expose it to, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's light or radiation or sound or whatever, so the, the right form of energy, and a few reagents, a few reactants that kind of trigger some of those things. Now, does that, does that solve aging? No, unfortunately, that one therapy didn't. But the fact that we can, that we can, we can latch onto the genetic machinery that's already there and we can, we can take some cells, de-age them, and then differentiate them into any other kinds of cells in a lab, it's like, okay, well... It, a priori, it's possible. Now we just have to figure out how to do it in vitro, which is like in, you know, with a medicine or some mm. kind of therapy with a living, breathing human without having to dissect them into a trillion, you know, cells and <laughs> de-age them one at a time because that's not feasible. But it is all hypothetically possible already. So then it's just yeah. a matter of, okay, how do we make this a practical uh, medical uh, solution? Do you have any thoughts on mRNA? Uh, I've heard it. I think it might have been Elon Musk who said this, but as, a, as the jump from analog to digital in terms of medical science, is it something that you've ever looked into? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So there's a, it's actually something that um, that I'm following relatively closely because there okay. are there are potential mRNA vaccines that could cure high cholesterol, which I have like endogenous like familial high cholesterol. Okay. Um, and so there's there's I think two therapies, may, maybe just one that are being studied. So, anyways, mRNA is like that is the switchboard that gives you access to all the genetic codes. Because if you can, if you can create, so it means messenger mRNA. So it's literally like the carrier pigeon that can bring signals or instructions to any cell in your body. Um, and once you get control over that, then all you need to know is like which buttons to push and in what order in order to get the outcome that you want from your body. Now, you know, the part and parcel with this is it can be very dangerous. Um, you can end up creating, you know, metabolic disorders or uh, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of horrible things if you do it wrong. So it is an incredibly powerful technology, but we need to be careful about it. Uh, I, again, it is a very powerful technology, and I think it is a part of the solution. But I, I'm not convinced that mRNA vaccines or other, other mRNA technologies will be a complete solution to aging. Uh, but it's certainly a very powerful tool in the toolbox. I've just realized that we've, uh, I, I'm going to have limited monetization now that I've mentioned mRNA because uh, YouTube won't <laughs> like it. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to appeal that one in advance, I think. Um, there you go. Been, been down this road before, yeah. Never, I've never mm. said anything about any of the stuff that they don't want me to talk about, but I think just there's, there's some keywords that they don't like. Um, cool. Okay. Well, look, um, 
I'm, uh, we're, we're, we're coming up on an hour. You've been very generous with your time. Um, the last thing I would love to hear more about is um, the ACE framework. I've seen you posting about it, but I would love to get uh, an intro to what it is you're doing um, and, uh, and why you're excited about it. Yeah. So thanks for asking. So the, the ACE framework is, at the fundamental level, it's a cognitive architecture. And so a cognitive architecture is a software blueprint to make a thinking mind. Uh, there's two primary ways that cognitive architectures have been approached in the past. So one is biomimicry, where you just try and make software that mimics the human brain close enough that you have a thinking machine. And another way is more of a functional approach, where you try and rather, rather than uh, copy the structure of the brain, you just copy some of the cognitive functions. And so mm -hmm. with the advent of language models like GPT, um, that's when I said, oh, okay, this is the fundamental engine that I can use to build a cognitive architecture. So I've been working on this kind of technology for the last four years, um, and the ACE framework is the latest and most sophisticated implementation, which is more of a layered kind of hierarchical uh, attempt at creating um, this, this software blueprint, this architecture, to create a fully autonomous uh, thinking machine. So that's what it stands for, ACE is Autonomous Cognitive Entity. And so this is, this is basically an attempt to build a digital brain, something that, that you could hypothetically one day just... Uh, it, as a as a software stack, plug it into a droid or a car or whatever, and it can take over and you know it can uh, have some some level of personality depending on what you want it. But really, the key thing is to create an autonomous machine that is self directing and self stabilizing, and ideally safe in the long run. I don't know mm. that this is going to be the way that it plays out in the long run, um, but certainly um, it's the best that we've got right now, um, and I'll be very curious to see uh, how the next generation of AI models play out. Because right now we're experimenting with multimodal models, which might mm -hmm. invalidate all of my work. This has happened before with how fast AI is advancing, where it's like, well, there goes six months of work or a whole year of work, and you know, mm -hmm. some, some advancement comes out and completely invalidates it. But so far, so good. Uh, but yeah, so the idea is like, imagine you know, Commander Data from Star Trek or C-3PO. The ACE framework is, the, is just the brain, just the software that could drive a robot like that. Or it doesn't have to be embodied. It could be a fully digital agent, uh, like you know Cortana from Halo or Samantha from the movie Her. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to build is a digital brain. Okay, and presumably there are differences in the way you would set that up if it were embodied versus existing purely you know, in the cloud or whatever, right? Like you, you, there must be some differences in the way that the, the architecture is set up or, or you know, perhaps actually, not, I don't know. Yeah, no. Um, so the idea is that you'd have an I.O. layer, so an, a set of APIs. So the brain, like in, like in a human, you, you know, everything in your brain kind of goes out through the brainstem, right? Or almost everything, not everything. But like your brain has like the equivalent eyes. of an API, right? right? Yeah. Uh, eyes, eyes and nose, I think, are the only senses that go straight to the brain. Yeah, um, okay. Maybe taste, I'm not sure. But there, like you have a you have a very small handful of nerves that go straight to the brain, but the rest goes in through your spinal cord, um, and so you have this one main bus in and out of the brain, um, and so hypothetically, like your brain could acclimate to any hardware that's on that main bus, and so likewise with the ACE wow. framework, the, the yeah the idea is that we would have a main like abstraction layer where it's just like okay here's all the APIs that it has access to, whether or not it's hardware or software or whatever. But like, so then you just have a bundle, like a, 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 a you know, spinal column or a, 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 a nervous system where it's, here's all the APIs that you have access to. You know, here's one for a Google search, here's one for a robotic chassis, and here's one for, you know, controlling the house or whatever. Um, but then ideally you can also have it where the APIs that it has access to can change. So you could have this, this software architecture that it could go into like pure software mode or pure hardware mode or kind of, uh, be in multiple places at once. There's all kinds of things you can do once you get to that level of abstraction of having multiple APIs. And, you know, that uh, that wasn't even my idea. There have been models that are trained to use like 100,000 different APIs out there. So it just seemed like an emergent thing like, oh, okay, well, if these language models can use any number of APIs, let's just go, let's lean in with that technology. So that's kind of where that idea came from. Yeah, wow. Um, wow, well, that sounds incredibly exciting um i mean do, do you think it will be sentient do you do you anticipate emotions emerging from uh from from this this thinking cognitive entity at some point 
You know, it probably will have some subjective sense of being, but it will not be, it'll be as different from us as like what, as different it is to be like a tree, right? Because like a tree is a living thing and you could probably say like, well, the, the tree can, you know, feel distress. It can sense, you know, when something is going on, but it doesn't have eyes. It doesn't have ears. It mostly just has chemical sensors and it can feel the sun, you know, and the relative temperature. Um, and I, so I think that, I think that even if, even if machines can have a facsimile of human experience, I think that I think that whatever their subjective experience is, it will be radically different from ours, at least mostly. Um, now, will it will it know what like sadness truly feels like? Maybe not, but it it's also possible that they will end up developing their own uh, emotional repertoire. It's their own set of feelings and subjective senses of being, and their own kind of qualia that like. You know, it would be as impossible for us to to describe to them as it is for them to describe to us. Like, you know, prove to me that you experience blue the same way that I do. And, you know, like <laughs> we can describe the, the, you know, the wavelength, but that's, that's as far as we can get. And that's yeah. one of the fundamental things about consciousness. And this is one thing that I'm prepared to accept is we might never have a satisfactory explanation for consciousness. Like no matter how much science advances, it might always be a mystery. So it's like, yeah. okay, well, <laughs> we'll have to just take it on, take it on faith that like, you know, we're all conscious. And if the machine tells us that it's conscious, okay, you know, like we won't be able to prove or disprove it. It's a, it's an unprovable assertion as far as I can tell. Yeah. Do you not have much faith in faith in brain computer interfaces then? Cause I feel like that might be one way to extract a kind of objective. Yeah. Definition. Yeah. So the biggest thing that I'm worried about with, with brain computer interfaces is there's this there's this neurological uh, uh, thing called neglect, where if you have certain uh, brain injuries or brain diseases, you lose the ability to pay attention to certain things. It just doesn't enter your consciousness. Um, and so my my fear is that from an outside perspective, you would appear fully consciousness, or you would you would appear fully conscious and and aware and able to answer things, but internally. As your brain is, you know, interfacing with a machine or getting replaced by a machine, your consciousness would actually be contracting, and then the machine would just be pretending to be you. <laughs> so oh, I will not God. be first in line to get a brain computer interface. <laughs> New fear unlocked. Yeah. Jesus, She's stuck yep. inside your own head while the computer pretends to be you in the world. Oh. Yep. That's. Yep. I feel like that's a there's a there's a book waiting to be written there, isn't uh -huh. there? Uh huh. Yeah. From yeah. the perspective of the guy stuck inside his own brain. Right. Yep. So oh. and. and so like a lot of people talk about like the ship of Theseus idea where it's like you slowly yeah, replace yeah. parts of your brain one at a time. I'm like, but what if the machine is a close enough facsimile of you and it's convincing enough that it seems like you, but the real you is actually shrinking and slowly eroding. And I'm like, I don't want to live through that. I don't oh, know if God. that's possible, but that's kind of what I'm afraid of. <laughs> yeah. Well, me too now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Glad, oh, God, glad to give you right. a new nightmare fuel. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man, for sure. God, I will. You know, I, that, I, I'm going to be thinking about this uh, all evening now. Um, mm. Cool. Well, look on that on that on that happy on that note. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, look, um, you've you've been super generous with your time, so I really do appreciate it, David. Um, it's been really insightful, really interesting. So, thank you very much for coming on. You're quite welcome. Good talk. Looking forward to next time. Have a good one. Yes, for sure. Thanks, David. Complete check. Heads. Well, we're running, baby.